Okay, um, we should probably kick things off. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Mitesh, and I'm going to be your host for the evening. Tonight, you're going to hear from the Institute and Fac Faculty of Actuaries and one of their member companies, Aegon. The IFOA is the member body of the actuarial profession, and Aegon is one of their largest life insurance, pension, and asset management organizations in the world. Today, our speakers include Richard Scott, who's head of head of UK, Europe and employers at the IFOA. Craig Christmas, who is talent acquisition and employer brand at Aegon. And Susan Ewing, who's, capital, who's a capital reporting actuary at Aegon. Before I hand it over to Richard, I just want to quickly share my actuarial journey with you. One of the things was, had I known what an actuary was before my final year at university, I may well have become one. I'm hoping by being on this webinar today, you'll learn how to make your application stand out and what an actuary does, allowing you to pursue your future career. Finally, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat and we will go through them in the Q&A session at the end webinar. So we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. And one last thing, this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss anything, we'll share the, the video link with you tomorrow and you'll be able to watch it, watch it over again. With that, I'm going to hand over to Richard now. Mitesh. Uh, so yeah, really excited to be here talking to you um, and explaining a bit more about what the IFOA Institute and Faculty of Actuaries does and how we support our members. So the IFOA is the UK's only chartered professional body dedicated to training, developing and regulating actuaries both in the UK and around the world. With just over 32,000 members in 122 countries, we set the standards, we train and examine our actuaries, and we also um, ensure they address to the professional codes of conduct. Speaking back to our UK heritage and also our chartered body, Public interest is a huge part of what we do, and not only training our actuaries and supporting them through their careers, but also ensuring that the wider society also benefits from the advice and guidance that actuaries can provide. To become a qualified actuary, you need to train and qualify with the IFOA or one of the other professional bodies dedicated to training actuaries elsewhere in the world. So what is an actuary? At the heart, actuaries are problem solvers. They use their skills in maths and analytics to measure probability and risk of future events. Typical areas that they might work in uh, include uh, general insurance, life and health, uh, also finance um, with strong members in investment, as well as pensions, enterprise risk, resource and environment and data science. We also continue to see our members applying their skills in analytics and problem solving to an ever growing number of fields brought about by the increasing use of data within large companies, everything from retail um, to health and care. So on the call, you may be thinking why you should become an actuary. So as I mentioned, we have members in 120 countries. By being a professional body and a member of a global um, professional body, it means that qualifying with the IFOA gives you an international passport, allowing you not just to work in the UK, but to take those skills that are recognized throughout the world um, and work in a number of different areas. Also, skills of actuaries are in demand globally, um, giving you a lot of job security, as well as a structured training program to help you go through the qualification and um, the remuneration of a well-deserved career, um, as well as other opportunities within your employer to apply those learned skills you've learned to a number of different areas. You can also find out lots more about how to become an actuary, um, hear from some more of our members about the skills that they gathered and what they enjoyed about becoming a member. What I'd say was the biggest thing though is a sense of curiosity. If you're thinking of becoming an actuary, um, most of our members do need a strong skill set in maths and an analytical mind, but most important is a desire to learn, to solve problems and to help wider society. So. With that, um, and to hear more about what actuaries do in practice, I'd like to hand over to Susan and Craig. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Much appreciated. Um, nice to be with you all this evening, and thank you very much for your time. So, 
Um, initially, what we'll do is we'll go through a little bit of an overview um, to who we are um, and Aegon as an organisation, um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, application processes and the key kind of aspects to look at through that. So um, the session will cover preparing a CV, it will cover cover letters, it will cover interviews and, and the, the guidance we would give around that. LinkedIn, which is a really important and powerful tool um, to everybody's disposal. And then, as uh, the team said at the start, we'll do a Q&A at the end. So if you do have any questions as we go through, please put them in the chat. So as a brief introduction to me, my name is Craig Christmas. Um, I'm the Talent Acquisition and Employer Brand Manager here at Aegon. I've worked at Aegon for just over a year. Um, prior to that, I worked um, I worked in talent acquisition for over 10 years, over a decade now, um, and I've covered um, a number of different industries um, and professions across my experience. So I've worked with a number of different financial services organisations um, and small to medium-sized businesses as well across that 10-year programme. So I've seen uh, a lot of good things and a lot of not so good things when it comes to uh, the, what we're about to discuss in this session. So hopefully some of the examples that I can give uh, throughout it will help you in your own journey moving forward. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague Susan, who will just introduce herself um, and what she does with Aegon as well, um, and then we'll move forward into the session, which will cover CVs um, in, in the first instance prior to coming back to myself for cover letters. So Susan, over to you. Thanks, Craig. Hi, so I'm Susan. Uh, I'm a capital reporting actually at Aegon, so I actually joined Aegon 13 years ago, um, straight from uni onto their graduate scheme um, for the actuary trainee programme, so I qualified through the IFOA exams. Um, qualified, finished, finished them after about five or six years and for the past five or six years I've been involved in helping to run um, the actual graduate scheme at Aegon as well as our summer internship programme. So that means I've been involved in running assessment centres, doing interviews and reviewing CVs. So hopefully I'll be able to feed back some of the good things we've seen from that as well, things that you'd be able to improve on yourself um, to make you stand out more. So we're going to start with a, a poll. So how many of you actually have up-to-date CVs um, as the first poll we're going to ask? So just a yes or no. Let me just uh, put it on there, sorry. That's great, thanks. Hopefully the technology works okay for us. You see if it's launched? Yeah, so we yep. do seem to, we started out strongly. Yes, we started out, but we are now, um, it's more trending towards the no of the responses we've got so far. Which is perfect for this session, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> so ho hopefully after this session, um, you're going to change your mind about that and you're going to go and update your CV. So I suppose the first question is, why is a good CV important? Generally, your CV is the first impression you'll make on a recruiter. The job market is highly competitive, so there can be a number of applicants for any roles and recruiters have to wh whittle the down fairly quickly to a small number that they're going to invite for interviews, assessment centres, whatever their hiring practice is. And the CV might be the only information they have to do that on. So you really do need to make sure it stands out. So, for example, we had eight summer internship roles this year. We received over 400 CVs, so we had to whittle that down to between 16 to 24 people to invite to investment assessment centres and then we had to take that down to eight so that is it's off the CVs we got only two percent were going to be offered roles because we get so many CVs in for that and um, so if you want to stand out against other people and show how good you are as a person you really do need an impressive CV because a mediocre one's just not going to cut it you're not going to get through that many people if you've not put that effort in so the most important thing really, it's not just the content of your CV, it's also how you format it. The easier your CV is to read, the easier it is on the recruiter. They're going to remember, right, I could read this, it was nicely set out. So you want to use a sensible font, something like Ariel or Times New Roman, Verdana, just something that's nice and easy to read that's fairly common. Um, make sure your name and contact details at the top of a CV. But one of the worst things I've ever seen is a CV without a person's name on it. If you don't put your name on the CV, how do we know you're talking about who you're talking about? Um, size of the CV is quite important. 
normal practice would generally be no more than two sides of A4. It's okay if you go a wee bit over that, but we don't want a page long document. Um, space out your CV so it makes sense, you know, using font size or headings and spacing and bullet points just to make it easier to read um, and more to follow. Now, in the UK, standard practice is do not put a photo on your CV. Unless you're going to be a model or an actor or an actress, don't put your photo on the CV. It's, it's not going to help. It's not relevant um, to what you're applying from. Generally, you don't have to start from scratch. If you're not sure where to start, there's so many templates online for different styles of CV. So you can go online and have a look and maybe take a template to start from and then tailor it to yourself. And make sure you spell check your CV and check your grammar because um, you don't want to have like a glaring spelling mistake right in the middle of your CV. And I would always recommend getting somebody else to review it, whether it's a teacher, a guidance counsellor, a friend, a parent, anyone. I would always get somebody to check it. And basically, don't waste space on your CV or your curriculum vital if you want to give it its proper Latin name. If you're if you're sticking to the two sides of A4 rule, just make sure you're using it um, for the important information. So, what should you include in your CV? One important thing is don't lie in your CV. So it, it might they might not find out straight away, but when they're speaking to you, they're going to find out you're going to say something by accident. So, only put things that are true in your CV. You always want to have your contact details, so name, address, email, phone number, that sort of thing. If you don't have a sensible email address, if you've got an email address that's like a funny name or something, I would recommend for your uni applications, for job applications, just set up a generic one with, a, with some offshot of your name um, to make it easier. You don't want to be sending out all these silly named email addresses um, on applications. So if you're Professional profile, so what's quite common now is just giving a wee descriptive or synopsis at the top of your CV, just to highlight for it. And it's a good idea to always tailor that to the role you're going for. So if you're going for a retail job, make it relevant for that. If you're going for a job in finance, make it relevant for that. Just do these little things. Technically speaking, you should tweak your CV for every application you do so it's tailored to the company, but at the very least, tailor it to the sort of industry um, that you're going for. You want to have an education section. So whether that's your school um, exam results, a university degree, if you've had any like awards that would be relevant, you can even, um, so if you, you know, like the school's mass award, if you've got best in something at school, if you've won something, something like that that you think is relevant, pop that in as well. Professional experience, so that doesn't necessarily just need to be full-time jobs. If you've had a part-time job, if you've done any work experience, any volunteering, it's a good idea just to put that in um, and highlight some of the key skills you've learned. Another area that's fairly common is people do a core strengths and lists off their key, their key strengths in their CV, but it's a good idea to sort of give an example. Don't just go, I've got good team working skills, maybe put through taking part in guides or beavers or scouts, I've learned team working skills, we organised, you know, fundraisers, something like that, just to give a bit more detail to what you're doing. Cover your interests. So your CV is not just about what you've done academically and professionally. You can put in sort of sports, clubs that you've done, volunteering, hobbies. Have you completed the Duke of Edinburgh? You know, things like that just to keep, um, to help you stand out of it. You might want to include some other information. So if you're proficient in any computer languages or computer programs that would be relevant to the role. Um, if you're applying for a role that would need you to be able to drive, pop in if you've got a full driving licence. These sort of things, just that extra information that doesn't necessarily fit into the categories. And then you should always have a bit for references on your CVs. You can either pop in the contact details. Always ask the person first to make sure they're happy with you using them as a reference. Um, or you can pop in available and request if you don't want to put the details in to start with. So I will now hand over to Craig, who's going to tell you a bit more about covering letters. Well, thanks, Susan. And it's uh, lovely to hear all that. And I must admit, over the years, I've seen everybody probably make a mistake at some point in that. So it's very relevant. Um, moving on to cover letters. So cover letters, uh, for those that, that don't know, are um, effectively the front of your application. Now, um, not every organisation will ask you to put a cover letter in. A lot of the time now it is optional um, and the vast majority of people don't do it. Um, now, Susan and I had a good chat about this last week and it's something that I feel quite passionate about because it does make applications stand out. Now, Susan gave you an overview of 
the number of applications that we we get uh, for our programs as well as our um, active roles to the market for what we call specialist hiring um, and colleagues or, and candidates that put in cover letters do generally stand out what it is it's an opportunity and it says in, in the deck here as, as a sales pitch it's your opportunity to pull out all the key areas of your experience and your out of work experience to really sell who you are and why you are the right candidate for the job many people fail to recognize what a good cover letter is and a lot of the time it can impact getting getting an interview now susan used the example earlier about our own program that we done last year with those 400 applications it was a very very small population of people that put in their cover letters and susan correct me if i'm wrong but every single person that put a cover letter in did actually get through to the assessment center so it does make you stand out and it's something that is really important um you know during your you during your journey and especially coming out of sort of school and early education because a lot of the time it is really what you're doing within your courses and your own uh, exams which makes you stand out and a CV can only tell you so much. So your cover letter is that pitch, it's that sales pitch. So sort of moving forward onto the, onto the next slide we'll give you a little bit um, of an overview of what sort of um, pros and cons are to having um, a good sort of cover um, cover letter and some of the good tips to have uh, on here. So a bit like your CV, things like making sure you address it to the right person. So a lot of time we'll see dear hiring manager. Now dear hiring manager is fine if you don't know, but if there's a name on the advert, use it, you know, try and um, be as personable as you possibly can. Make sure that it's your own details that are written. Um, we are seeing, um, you know, candidates now using things like AI, ChatGPT to um, to to write it for them. It's it's very obvious to a recruiter when that's getting used. So be authentic, be yourself, um, and that will really shine through during your uh, through your cover letter. Try and the one thing I would say is don't duplicate your cv don't um just lift and shift it it is a supporting document so for some of you that might have been doing university applications or you're thinking towards doing that a bit like that personal statement that you would have done for 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 those applications really think about what you know susan used the examples of the duke of edinburgh you know bbs all that type of good stuff that's the type of thing that can really set set you out so think about that as a as a real push there Remember to tell the recruiters what you can offer um, rather than what you, they can do for you. So what are your USPs? That's your unique selling points. Try and avoid buzzwords as well. That's one thing that we see. Um, that can be quite off-putting for, for recruiters and hiring managers. As I said, it goes back to that authentic self. Be yourself when you're doing this, but be precise and direct. Um, yeah, it kind of ties into the next point here about the strong positive language as well. I'm confident rather, you know, rather than I feel or believe what are the kind of key aspects that you want to to get across um, and then make sure that ultimately, and this is really important, um, that you check your spell and your grammar and your punctuation, get somebody to check it because there's a lot of the time that that will not uh, it's very obvious and it can put off, especially as a recruiter, I see it quite a bit. It doesn't necessarily put me off, but it puts the hiring managers off a lot. Um, so please make sure your attention to detail is really, really on point with that. Um, Susan, I'll hand over back to you on interviews. Yep. Um, so next up, chat about the interviews. Um, so preparation is really important if you're going for an interview. So Make sure you read the job description or the job advert that's relevant, just so it's all clear in your head. Um, so, you know, find out what the role is and what any expectations you are. I would always recommend doing a bit of research on the company online because most interviews I've taken part in or given, one of the first questions is, why would you like to work for our company? So you want to be able to answer that. You want to be able to say, you know, oh, you're an industry leader or I'm, I'm really in line with your ESOS. Just make sure you've got something to answer that question. Um, have a copy of your CV to hand, whether you're doing it in person or virtually. It's a good prompt to have in front of you just to have something if you're not sure what to say. Um, and think about questions you're likely to get asked. So some companies will send you out a pack beforehand that they won't give you the questions, but they'll give you a bit of guidance on sort of what sort of things they're going to be asking. So you can use that um, to prepare answers. I would recommend thinking of maybe four to six scenarios that you might use to answer questions and jot down some bullet points on them. So it's okay to have notes in an interview, but don't just read from a piece of paper. Just have a couple of bullet points to refresh yourself if you need to look down so that when you're speaking to an interviewer, 
you're talking to them, not looking down at a piece of paper. Um, yeah, prepare your technology in advance. So if you're doing a virtual interview, um, make sure your camera, your microphone's working, you know, you're not in a, a really noisy room where you're not going to be able to hear what the person's saying. Make sure everything's working and um, get that set up ahead of time. So before this call, we had a little to make sure that everyone's sound was working, just to make sure we could all be heard. Um, and don't use AI or chat GBC to generate your answers. It, it's going to be quite obvious um, when you're speaking to the interviewers that AI is just not smart enough yet to really sound like a human given the answers. And if you're trying to read off something that's been written, you're probably going to trip up over yourself. So as well as conducting your research and planning your responses, choose your outfit. So dress wisely. If you're, if you're turning up for a job interview, don't turn up in a pair of jogging bottoms, a pair of ripped jeans, you know, look smart. You don't need to be in a full three-piece suit. Maybe wear your school uniform without the tie or the blazer so that you're wearing, you know, black trousers and a shirt, that sort of thing. Um, wear something that's appropriate and sort of take your materials. If you're taking a CV and you're taking some notes, make sure you've got them with you. Um, get yourself in the zone. So maybe, you know, 30 minutes before the interview, just make sure you've got that time to prepare, get yourself in a nice calm state. We all get nervous before an interview. This might surprise you, even the interviewers get nervous about doing interviews because they're worried about tripping up when they're asking their questions or saying the wrong thing. Or So it's, it's not just the interviewee who gets nervous about these sort of things. Um, and it's good practice to establish a follow up. So if you're able to get feedback on an interview, this is particularly important if you're not successful, if a company is willing to give you feedback on how you can improve, that can be really helpful um, for the next interview that you do. So what's a competency-based interview? Um, so competency-based interview is a structured interview. They're always looking for real life examples rather than hypothetical. And it's about assessing your technical ability to do the role. Um, these have actually been around for a long time. So like more than most of you have been alive. Um, they've been around since the early 1990s. And sort of example questions would be, tell me about a time you dealt with a demanding customer or tell me about a time you helped another team member develop an idea. So how do you go about answering these sort of questions? You really want to find a technique that works for you um, so that you have a structure for your answer. Um, I would recommend the star technique is one that I use personally. So you break it down into your situation, your task, your action and your result. So the situation you want to set up at the background because the interviewer doesn't really know the, what you're going to be talking about. The task, you want to set out what your objective or your goal was, what your aims were, just set in the scene a bit more. The action, so that's what happened. What did you do? This is quite important. When you're doing an interview, they're asking about you. So try to use I and not we. Um, it's feedback I once got for an interview that I did that I used we too much. I kept talking about like a team instead of saying what I had done. Um, that's what they're really interested in is knowing that. And a key one that a lot of people miss is the result. So tell us, you know, did you meet the outcome that you set out of? Um, if the outcome was negative, talk about what you'd do differently, what positives you took from this, you know, what you learned from this, just to sort of wrap up the situation um, so you know what's going on. So some key tips is be yourself. Um, I think that's the best thing to do because it's easier to talk when you're being yourself than if you're trying to put on sort of airs and graces or pretend something that you're not. It just makes it easier. And if you're coming up with like real life, always talk from your own examples and experience. Don't talk from something you think you know or that someone else does and you're trying to pass it off just be honest and answer based on yourself when you're responding it's okay to take a wee pause just have a wee think you don't have to start speaking as soon as the interviewer stops talking and um, yeah as i mentioned earlier using i rather than we and using a technique so if you don't like the star one there's a couple different options out there just find one that works for yourself just to give you that answer for your that structure for your answer if you get tricky questions that you're just not sure how to answer there's a few different things you can do um, you can ask if you could come back to that question later in the interview. If you don't understand quite what the question is asking, maybe ask for some clarification on the point, or point of the question just so you can understand it better. And then if you've given an answer and you actually think, do you know what, maybe that wasn't relevant now that I've talked it through, offer to give another example so they can see that, that you do know that, you know, once you, sometimes when you start talking about a situation, you realise it doesn't really answer the question they've asked and you think actually it'd be better given this one. And I will hand back over to Craig now um, to talk about the importance of LinkedIn. Thanks, Susan. Um, and just before we, we jump onto that, we'll just do another quick poll because it was interesting to see that there was a split of people that had CVs and who didn't. So hopefully that's been 
really helpful to take you through sort of the basics of, of how to do that and then the interview process. But um, on the chat, hopefully you'll see a poll about who has a, a LinkedIn profile. So I'll just give that a minute if you could just quickly click, click, click that through. I'd be much appreciated just to get a bit of a steer of how proficient you all are with that. Okay, I think I can see them coming through. So I've seen a lot more yeses than noes actually this time, which is quite interesting. Yeah, it's starting to kind of level out towards 60, 40. So there's a good percentage of people that have it and not about 50, 50 now, because we've got about 50 people responding. So very interesting. So LinkedIn is something that obviously, as I said at the start, I, I look after Aegon and our employer brand. Um, now, LinkedIn is an extremely powerful tool for us to do that, but it's also an extremely powerful uh, tool for using individual. I'm going to chat you through just a little bit about uh, what, what LinkedIn is and some of the, the kind of key stats that you'll see on this slide here. So LinkedIn is not a social media platform. Um, a lot of the time you'll hear people say it's a kind of social media platform. It's it's not. It's a professional kind of tool, and that's how, that's how I see it. Um, You'll see some of the the size of it here. So, for instance, it's had it's got over 930 million users on LinkedIn globally. So, it's a really powerful tool in relation to the reach that you can have. Some of the key things that tie into this session um, is that we um, we see or LinkedIn sees that eight people get hired every minute through LinkedIn. So, it's something that's extremely powerful for you as a job seeker. 117 job applications submitted on LinkedIn every minute across the globe. So it gives you an idea of the size and scale of it and the importance um, of, of why you should have an up-to-date profile because it is an extension to your CV and to your cover letter as we talked through um, earlier on. Um, people that do post on it, obviously that has a reach. I think, you know, for you you guys at, at the stage of the career that you're in, it's probably that overall job searching piece, and that's what we'll focus on today. But hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of some of the reach you can use and some some tips and help um, when you start becoming a bit more proficient with the platform moving forward. So I'm going to just um, chat through a bit, a bit about your profile now. You'll see my profile on the, the right-hand side here. Um, these are some basic tools on what, how to, or basic tips to get set up uh, on this. Now, this actually comes from LinkedIn themselves and what is best practice. Um, so I'll talk you through them and, and, and kind of why you should do so. So initially, um, a professional photo is really important. So members with a professional photo um, can get up to 21 more times views than somebody without. Now, when I say professional photo, one like mine is fine. It's got a clear background towards. Just be very conscious of the environment you're in. Less is more when it comes to LinkedIn. Think about your yourself as your own personal brand. And, you know, uh, hiring managers and recruiters will look at your LinkedIn as an extension to your CV. So it's really important that it's how you want to be, how you want to be portrayed as, as effective and authentic. Make your headline stand out. So, for instance, you can see mine. It's got talent acquisition manager. It's got talent attraction employer brand. Some of the key skills that I've got, some of the key focus areas for me in my role. What's yours? You know, so when you start moving into your, you know, your roles, what what is it that you're kind of specialising in? What's your kind of unique sell? And that that will really help your profile become. It will make it stand out and become visible to recruiters. Right, a summary. So who are you? What are you about? Who do you work for? Now, you can see mine is very focused around Aegon because I represent the organisation. But for you guys, it will be more personal to you. So what are your skill sets? Again, it's that extension of your CV. Use your profile, use your cover letter because it's really important that it, it duplicates across and it is um, representative of you as an individual. It then ties into your work experience and education experience. Now, for a lot of people on the call, they might be coming out of you know school or early education. You know, what are the experiences you've got and the, the life experiences you've got that will sell you apart, especially if you don't have that work experience yet and that's what you're moving towards. So it's something to really kind of press on there and use your sort of experience and skill set that you've got to, to really showcase uh, your career history to date and your educational history to date. Think about any relevant skills that you want to sell. Now, LinkedIn is used predominantly by recruiters to search. So what are the things, if you're looking to become an actuary, what are those key things, problem solving skills, math skills, all those types of things that are relevant? You know, use your education experience, use your own skills and really have them on there so it stands out to recruiters and what you're looking for. And then if you do have recommendations or references, think about getting them put onto the bottom of your profile, because again, that can that can make you stand out in the marketplace. One of the things just to to really flag, and it's it's quite a quite an important one. Um, Susan and I talked a bit about earlier, but some of the mistakes you can make in your CV and your cover letter. Now you'll have all seen some probably experiences and stories, uh, maybe in the news or or in different news outlets. 
um, be very careful about what you you share and what you put on 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 LinkedIn and any social platform for that matter. It is you are your personal brand. I use that 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 phrase quite a lot. It's your reputation. So whatever you're trying to put or whatever you are putting on there, make sure it is, you know, representative of how you want to be portrayed. Think about it. Will it hurt or improve your personal brand? The the, the example that I would give you is, um, you know, if if you had a family member reading it, would would that make you know would you would you cringe a little bit? Would it make your toes curl? If so, kind of think about it. Think about it twice. Get a friend to check it. You know, run it by somebody so to make sure that you protect yourself. And ultimately, with LinkedIn, keep it personal. Keep it professional. When in doubt, always get it. Always double check. Um, and that's kind of relates to all four of those key points. So LinkedIn is predominantly an extremely powerful tool um, to help you with your job search um, and to help you with your own brand and reputation management as you go through your career. But something to be to be used in the right way. So hopefully some of these tips have helped um, as we've gone through. So just to summarise, I think we're coming up just to the last 10 minutes of the presentation. So hopefully that's helped you all where you are in your own stage of your, your sort of career and your work experience. Um, but more than happy to take any Q&A and the hand back over to the team to, to host that. But hopefully you've all taken something from that. Hey, guys, thank, thank you very much for that. Hopefully um, all the people on this call found it useful. Um, there was some very insightful stuff in there, very useful stuff, uh, may I add. Um, we've had a few questions and we've had some questions before, so happy to kick it off. But guys, um, if you've got any questions, now's the time to ask them. Um, please ask them in the chat and we'll um, we'll make sure we'll try and get we'll try and get through them. So uh, on the topic of LinkedIn, um, Boran has asked how important are endorsements on LinkedIn? Uh, yeah, I can, I can take that one. So uh, they are important. Um, they're not a reference like you would get from an organisation or a school or education. I think it's something that can help you stand out from from um, you know from others. I, I wouldn't use it necessarily as a a kind of sell all the time, but it's something that can add to your profile. People will review it. I think my biggest piece on it is make sure it's authentic. If you've got your friends writing uh, recommendations for you, uh, it becomes pretty obvious. So use it in the right way um, would be my recommendation on that, but they can be useful. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, sort of sticking on the job, but looking at it from a slightly different perspective, we, we've spoken a lot about applying for the right job for you. Um, we've had a question that came in before that's asking how to tell if a job is right for you, what things to look for. And that was by Amy. Uh, yeah, I can I can take that one again. It probably sits within my world, uh, Susan, but please feel free to chip in if you, you disagree with me, which uh, hopefully you don't. Um, how can you make, a, make sure the job's right for you? I think research is really important to that. Um, I think be calculated with what you are applying for does it fit with your overall career ambitions so i think you know it can be quite hard to think about what you want to do sort of five ten years in in the future but that time does go quite quickly so i think review the review your long-term goal whatever that may be and if you're not quite clear on that think about that sort of 12 24 months right what what do i want to do what what sort of experience do i want to gain so if it's more problem solving skills what kind of roles will give me that experience and job adverts generally talk you through that It'll look at the essential criteria what makes somebody successful in that roles generally through the essential criteria so it's not an answer that i can give around i think you know becoming an ex is going to be your your dream job that's very individual but do the research behind what are your kind of key strengths what do you think would work um you know in a professional environment um and yeah i think it comes down to your own personal opinion or personal preferences on that but research is critical and uh, would be my overarching point on that susan and dad from your perspective and your own experience on that yeah, no, I would say as well, one of the stats I remember getting told when I was younger was that now people change careers like five or six times in their lifetime now. So just because it's the interview that you go for when you're straight out of school or straight out of uni, it doesn't mean it's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. And if you do have an interview, if, you're, if there's a things about the company or the role you're not sure about, most interviews will have time for you to ask a question as well um, so that you can ask a bit more about that company you know committing to an interview isn't committing to the job so it's that an interview really is the opportunity for you to find a bit more about the company as well as for them to find out a bit more about you 
um, so ahead of time maybe think of some questions you'd like to ask as well and if you know somebody who works in the industry or know somebody maybe try and arrange a chat with them we've had a few people where oh my son or my daughter is interested in this you know would you take five ten minutes just to chat to them about the role we've done that in the past so they're not at the stage where they're wanting to apply for that role but they just want to talk to somebody who's doing it if you do know somebody who's involved in a role you're interested in that can be really key just to find out a bit more about the day-to-day -day role Thank you very much. Um, hopefully that answers that question. I'm, I'm going to try and group a couple of questions together that we received um, because I think you might be able to answer them you know, all in one. Uh, one is, one is, can you become an actuary without doing A-level maths? The other is, what A-levels are beneficial for actuarial science roles? And then the third is, is the best way to become an actuary through a university or degree apprenticeship? I'm hoping that they all like kind of similar enough that you can answer them in in one one answer. Oops, so, do you want to take that one? Or? Yeah, I, can, I wasn't yep. sure if somebody might have wanted to take it. Um, so generally, there's two exams you can do with the IFOA. Um, a sort of entry level exams to kind of do without having come from a maths degree. Um, a lot of companies will have having a relevant subject or having set grades as part of their scope when they go out for a role. Um, but it doesn't need to be an actuarial science degree. So myself, I came from maths with computer science. I worked with people who did biology, who did physics, who did business. Some people did do actuarial science. It just means you can get some exemptions from some of the exams if you've come from an actuarial science degree. So it's not a must. Um, you can do sort of an area that interests you as long as it's sort of defined as relevant. So we tend to say numerate subjects, which tends or, or business or science um, will generally be fine for applying for an actuarial role. Um, whether doing a degree on apprenticeships better, I suppose that depends on yourself and your learning, because a lot of companies will want before putting you on a sort of a trainee scheme to go through the actuarial exams they generally are expecting you to have done university first. There might be some pathways through an apprenticeship, um, but it's not something I've got any knowledge of, I'm afraid, to share in terms of an actuarial apprenticeship. Yeah, I don't mind adding a bit. Um, it's definitely something um, newer, but we're seeing an increasing number of employers uh, taking uh, students before degree level um, and through um, an apprenticeship route. Some of them are formal apprenticeship routes. Some of them uh, have made their own um, entries into the profession uh, to support people uh, who don't have a degree. Um, I think like Susan said as well, there's a lot of benefits between taking an actuarial degree, but also not, and taking one that really speaks to you. Um, it can really help um, sometimes make your application stand out or give you a diversity in the way you may approach a problem to someone who's just studied actuarial maths all the way through. So I think the, the key thing is a, a maths-based or a numerate-based degree is the main thing, um, like Susan was saying. Thank you. Thank you for that, guys. Um, there are a few more questions and I want, I want to try and address this one that was asked in the chat. Um, how does your company support applicants who are autistic and uh, struggle in interviews can be anxious in these situations? And is it best to declare this to you beforehand or not? Um, I know you'll probably be only able to talk about your company, but hopefully it will give them an insight into like what other companies are like as well. Yeah, I can I can take that one. So um, yeah, something that's really important to to, to Aegon, um, we have a what we call a reasonable adjustments um, sort of policy, which is asked at the application stage. Um, so candidates who um, need a reasonable adjustments for you know um, any reason, and um, they can tick that box. And my team, who are the recruiters for the organisation, will speak to you directly about that and what support you need. So for instance, um, people that do feel like they need extra time. Um, that that can be given absolutely during that interview process to help answer the questions, um, you know, effectively. The other thing um, that we're actually doing, and it's going to be happening over the next couple of weeks, is we're actually providing interview questions in advance um, on our um, not every single interview question, but a sample of interview questions uh, that align to our behaviours uh, on our new career site. So that will help candidates with preparation. But one of the things that my team will do is is really to support um, support you through that journey. Um, with whatever that, that may be, um, alongside a reasonable adjustment policy. 
Um, in relation to other organisations, I, I can't comment on every organisation and what they do. Um, a lot of organisations will be different, um, but um, most companies generally and larger organisations will have a similar process around, they will ask you a question, of, do you need any reasonable adjustments at the start of that uh, application process? That is the opportunity for you to declare that. Organisations won't know unless you tell them. That is the opportunity there. And, and in our case, my team would then pick up with you directly and uh, you know work out what requirements and adjustments that you would need um, to be as um, you know effective through that interview process and assessment journey as possible. So hopefully that answers your question. Just a bit Thank you very on much. that from us. Um, I popped something in the chat with some more resources. So um, like Aegon, this is an area of the IFOA having our public interest agenda as well. So um, as well as going through the IFOA exams, there's regional adjustments and support for people who declare uh, either a neurodiversity or a, a disability or a need. Um, we also provide guidance to employers on best practice standards for people who have autism, um, as well as more generally supporting our members um, and how they may navigate their neurodiversity within the actuarial profession. Brilliant. Um, hopefully that was a useful answer for everyone on the call. Um, just digging out a question. Um, there's a question that says, are there any useful resources you can recommend so I can learn more about a career in actuarial science or as a career as an actuary? Yeah, I think um, I don't mind taking this and then if any Aegon colleagues want to jump in as well. Um, so I, I think um, Tessa and my colleague may have dropped something in the chat um, on our Becoming an Actuary page on the website. We have a lot of resources, um, some videos from members about their different journeys and routes into the profession, whether they took uh, going straight from university or joined on an apprenticeship route. Um, also some people talking about lived experiences, about the different areas, uh, domains, areas of actuarial work, countries they're working um, and things like that, as well as some more practical advice um, for you, your parents and careers advisors and skills about some opportunities in different firms, uh, as well as Aegon uh, and how you can become an actuary. Thank you. Um, as you guys know, um, the younger generation are a lot about like contributing to society and like how we make a difference. So one of the questions is, do you feel like you're contributing to society and making a difference as an actuary? I'll leave that one for you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think we do that from a few different angles. So I work in, I'm a capital reporting actually, so I basically work in the team that proves to our regulator that we have the capital provided so that, you know, our customers can be happy that we're a strong company. I think that's very important. And also there is a massive gap, I think, in understanding pensions um, and actuaries are very heavily involved in that and getting that understanding when you talk about pensions to most people they're very confused they don't understand you know how much you actually have to contribute kind of now in your working lifetime to be able to maintain your lifetime in the future and as um was mentioned earlier we're quite often involved in like the reporting and the regulation around climate change for companies and trying to help companies you know contribute to your company being net zero and things like that so there is lots of um society input and at Aegon we also have the ability to take two paid volunteer days um, so that you're able to put into practice some things and it's it's also good team building as well you should generally do it remember just your team so um i've done i've been out to a food bank we've, we've you know we've done painting and stuff at schools we've done lots of different things across the company um to try and help the community so there's there's that side of things as well as well as just the sort of what you can do professionally as an actuary a lot of um corporate companies are getting a lot more behind supporting volunteering um for their employees as well just to say, anyone who is on LinkedIn, uh, definitely worthwhile following the IFOA. We recently did a um, think piece for general public on pensions and saving for future. We also um, are petitioning government on some changes we're hoping to make to pensions. Uh, we've released a few papers recently on climate change, um, doing some actuarial modelling on what slightly outcome of certain costs of action, as well as um, the recent talk in government about creating a smoke three generation. One of our members recently wrote a piece um, delving into that and what the implications that could be for long term health in the NHS. So, uh, yeah, do you think about following the IFOA and you'll see some of the think pieces that our members are issuing on key topics. Thank you very much, guys. I'm going to ask one last question because we've got people dropping off and they probably want to go have dinner. Um, there's, a, there's a question about degree apprenticeships. Uh, as a student, I'm going to be applying. Could you give me some advice? Uh, it's a fairly general question. So um, 
I'll leave that to you if you can answer that at all. Yes, yeah, so I think it's similar to some of the stuff we've been talking about as well. If you're filling out an application form instead of a CV, you still want to check your spelling. You want to pull out your key skills that are relevant to the role. So if you can, the more you can find out about the apprenticeship, so you can almost map your skills and what you've done um, to what they're asking for. You know, if they tell you they're looking for somebody who's a problem solver, who's innovative, you know, who's good at working with people, find examples from that from your own either school work, through group work you've done, you know, through clubs and societies you take part, always try and match up what the blurb the company is asking for with your skills just to really tailor it um, to the role. I think it's important. Don't just sort of put a generic CV in and hope that that's going to hit the mark. Thank you. Um, one last thing for me, um, just on the degree apprenticeship stuff, we're actually launching a mentoring program with a load of volunteer apprentices who can tell you about their experience about applying for a degree apprenticeship. So. We're launching that about six weeks time. So if you're registered on our site, register on our site and you'll get added to our newsletter and you'll, you'll be the first to hear about that. I um, want to say thank you to the guys from Aegon and IFLA for this wonderful presentation. We will send you a link tomorrow with some feedback with the video. Um, yes, any other information that's uh, we will include on here, some, some links, etc. Just someone said what website? Um, our website's called Success at School and We'll send you the links to the IFOA website and Avon website if if appropriate. Thank you very much, guys. Have a lovely evening. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Thank Thanks you. so much. Bye. Bye. I'm doing an apprenticeship in accountancy. Doing a solicitor apprenticeship. Studying a level six chartered manager degree apprenticeship. I'm a level seven apprentice. A civil engineering degree apprenticeship. A level six financial services professional apprenticeship. Product design and development degree apprenticeship. And I'm a success at school, ask an apprentice community mentor, and I'm here to help you with all of your apprenticeship applications. Should I do that again? I should do that again. <laughs>